Hi everyone and welcome to the Leaving Star Chemistry channel with myself Emma Ronan, creator and owner of LeavingStarChemistry.ie. Head on over to that website if you want any of the notes that I discuss in this video or follow us on TikTok at LeavingStarChemistry.ie and Instagram and also over on Spotify where we have completely free Leaving Star Chemistry episodes on every single topic that you need to know for your Leaving Star Chemistry exam with helpful exam tips, tricks, exam structure and timing and so much more. So you can visit us on any of those platforms. In this video, it follows on from our very first one, History of the Atom. Make sure you look at that one as this, as I said, continues on. This is called Arrangement of Electrons in the Atom. We start off with Danish scientist Niels Bohr, who provided a picture as to what the arrangement of electrons around an atom looked like. He did this using the instrument called the mass spectrometer, and with this instrument, he studied spectra. A spectra is an array of colors produced when light is shone through an object. So for example, when white light shines through a glass prism, a spectrum of continuous colors form with no gaps. This is what we call a continuous spectrum. We need to be able to know the difference between a continuous spectrum, an absorption spectrum, and an emission line spectrum. But first, definition for continuous spectrum. It's defined as a spectrum which contains many colors or wavelengths with no gaps. That's going to be crucially important because from here, Bohr replaced the white light through a prism and he got a discharge tube with elements in gaseous form and he passed an electric current through them. So Bohr, as I said, and you can see it here, repeated this experiment, but he used electrodes attached to a hydrogen gas discharge tube. This emitted light through the prism and a continuous spectrum was not observed, but instead a series of narrow colored lines were seen. Okay, so we would have had a dark background Okay, so Bohr called this emission line spectrum because the element hydrogen is emitting light. Bohr repeated this experiment, but instead of using hydrogen, other elements were used. So emission spectra can be used to identify elements because each element emits light of definite frequencies or wavelengths and they differ from each other. Then we have AAS, which stands for Atomic Absorption Spectrometry. So it was later found that elements can absorb light too by carrying out a similar experiment. White light this time is passed through a gaseous sample, for example, hydrogen gas, and certain wavelengths were missing. So what appeared was a colored background with dark lines. The emission line spectrum of hydrogen appeared dark, except for unique colored lines produced a particular wavelength, and the absorption spectrum was the opposite. It appeared colored except for dark lines at particular wavelengths. The dark lines were in the exact same position as the colored lines in the emission spectrum. So if we look at the hydrogen absorption spectrum at the top and the emission spectrum at the bottom, if we combine those two, we would form a continuous spectrum. So hydrogen emits light, but it also absorbs white light when it's passed through. Okay, we need to be able to distinguish the difference between an emission line spectrum and an absorption spectrum. So that is what Bohr did. Uses of spectra then, so fluorescent lights worked off the basis of this emission spectra principle and also your mandatory experiment, your flame test investigation, you have seen how adding different salts of different metals produces different colours. Remember for your flame test investigation you need to know the names of your salts and the colours that they produced. So Bohr then, back to Niels Bohr, spectra are usually studied using an instrument called a spectrometer. And you will study this in more detail in the periodic table chapter where you will talk about all of the processes of how the mass spectrometer works and of course you will need to know those in the order in which they occur but as far as the arrangement of the electron chapter is concerned we do not cover the mass spectrometer yet so Bohr's theory then this is a common exam question Bohr explained his emission line spectra by proposing that electrons have a fixed amount of energy quantum or discrete can also be used. An electron in an atom is restricted to having certain energy levels of definite energy values. Energy levels are represented by the small letter n. n equals 1 is the first and the lowest energy level. Then we move on to n, energy level n equals 2 when the first energy level is filled. And then when the second is filled, we move on to energy level n equals 3. So Bohr's theory. He concluded that electrons move around the nucleus in fixed paths called energy levels, which we now know to be untrue. The energy of an electron in an atom can only have specific, unique, discrete values. Now we do know, as I say, electrons don't move around in fixed paths. So that was a limitation of his theory. The ground state then of an atom definition is one in which the electrons occupy the lowest available energy levels. If we supply an atom in its ground state with energy in the form of heat or electricity, a fixed amount of this energy is absorbed and the electrons move up to a higher energy level known as their excited state. However, 
they're not going to be stable there for very long. The energy absorbed is equal to the difference between the lower and the higher energy levels. As I said, those electrons in the excited state, they're unstable, so they fall back down to their ground state. And when they do, they release a particle of light known as a photon. And this photon has a fixed amount of energy. Okay, so that was the difference between the ground state and the excited state. The frequency depends on the energy difference between the higher energy level, E2, and the lower energy level, E1. E2 minus E1 equals Hf is their equation. Okay, so E2, higher energy level, E1, lower energy level, H is Planck's constant, and F is the frequency of light. Remember, every element produces its own unique emission line spectrum in emits light of a definite frequency. Sublevels then are subdivisions of a main energy level, and they consist of one or more orbitals of the same energy. The energy level tells us the number of sublevels within each energy level. So for example, the energy level n equals one has one sublevel, energy level n equals two has two. It's very important that you know that you must fill, and you'll see it from this diagram here, the 4s sublevel before you fill the 3d, because the 4s sublevel is lower in energy, so it must be filled first. And there you'll see the main energy levels and how many sublevels they contain. And it is really important that you know that for writing the electronic configurations, which you also come across in the periodic table chapter. Then we have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You might do this in the periodic table chapter, so don't worry if you haven't done it yet. It is impossible to measure at the same time both the velocity and the position of an electron because electrons are moving quite fast and we know now that they do not move in fixed paths and we can only refer to the probability of finding an electron. So that's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle there. Bohr's limitations then, another common question to be asked, Bohr's theory fails to account for many lines in atoms with more than one electron. It does not account for the many lines in the emission line spectrum, so it only works for hydrogen. We can only refer to the probability of finding an electron and not the exact location, so Bohr's fixed path idea was wrong, and Bohr also didn't take into account the existence of sublevels. Then we have orbitals and the definition of region and space close to the nucleus where there's a high probability of finding an electron. We will talk more about orbitals in a second when we move on to Erwin Schrödinger and his s and p orbitals and how he devised them using mathematical equations. But for now, we can only refer to a region where there's a high probability of finding an electron and not a fixed location. So Erwin Schrödinger worked out the probability of finding an electron in a sublevel of an atom. And he plotted equations in three different dimensions to give us 3D shapes of S, P, D and F orbitals. S orbitals are spherical, they only differ in their size. P orbitals are dumbbell shaped and they all have the same energy but they're made up of three parts, Px, Py and Pz. So here we have the S orbitals at the top and the P orbitals at the bottom. 1S is smaller than 2S and that's smaller than 3S. We have our Px, Py and Pz and it depends on where the dumbbell lies. So the dumbbell lies on Px it lies on the x-axis, py, it lies on the y-axis, and pz, it lies on the z. They all have similar energy. You must occupy them singly before filling them in pairs, which we will see in the periodic table chapter. But for now, you should be able to give a brief outline of Bohr's model, describe and explain energy levels, describe and explain the emission spectrum of hydrogen, describe and explain the absorption spectrum, relate energy levels to everyday applications, so your fireworks, etc. Define and explain sublevels, state Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That is everything you need to know for arrangement of electrons in the atom. If you want any of these notes, visit leavingsorchemistry.ie or follow us on social media.